How I love to tell the story of God's redemption plan. How Jesus died to take our sins away. But my finest words cannot express what one old rugged tree said best for nail to it was all God had to say the cross said it all the cross said it all without a word God's heart was heard for the cross said it all to prove his love like nothing else could God used three nails and two pieces of wood and the cross Write it in the heavens. He can spell it with a star. He can even paint it across the sky for all to see. But with his own blood. Jesus Christ wrote, I love you with his life, and forgiveness still resounds from Calvary. The cross said it all, the cross Without a word, God's heart was heard. For the cross said it all to prove his love like nothing else could. God used three nails and two pieces of wood. And the cross said it all. It's more than a symbol of suffering or a picture of pain in agony. For there at the cross, every soul that was lost. Is a bridge from earth to eternity. The cross said it all. The cross said it all. Without a word, God's heart was heard. For the cross said it all To prove his love like nothing else could God used three nails and two pieces of wood And the cross
Good morning, Manus Road Baptist Church family. Always, always a joy to be with you. Thank God for, again, the opportunity. Now, you know me. You got to hug yourself. That's just the way it is. You just got to hug yourself for me. Uh, we're still, I think we're getting close, but we're not there yet. So we still want to say to each and every one of you how much we miss the physical touch and the presence. But uh, as someone says, what does NFL stand for? That means not for long. So we're looking looking down the road to see how God would guide that we can start getting back to what we all deeply miss. But until then, this is our this is the medium that he's given us, and we thank him for it. And I'm sure if the Apostle Paul was in prison today and he had the medium of Internet, I'm sure he'd be on every podcast page, website. He'd use it all because he, he had to wait on a letter. And then he wasn't even sure if it was going to get there. But here he would be everywhere. So we take advantage today of the technology that he's given us. And uh, we marvel that he's given us this medium today to come into your home and into your presence that we can, even though absent in body, still get together in spirit. We want you to get into your Bibles and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verses 1 through 4. Now, don't be shocked by the title. I'm just going to give you the title out the gate. The title of the message this morning is, I Am Jealous. And uh, we're going to cover this matter of jealousy, what Paul is talking about in this passage. Uh, when it is appropriate to be possibly jealous and when it is a bad thing to be jealous. But here we have a message from the Apostle Paul. So 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 4. We'll read, and right after the reading, we're going to pray. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 through 4, the Holy Spirit writes to us, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we've not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you've not received, or another gospel, which you've not accepted, you might well bear with him. I am jealous. Father, thank you for this opportunity once again to open up your blessed book, to Lord, to be enlightened, to be motivated and encouraged, to not only to worship you better, closer, have a closer intimacy with you, but also, Lord, maintain that intimacy that nothing ever comes between us and you, and there are no rivals for your affections that we ought to love the Lord our God, and nothing and no one else, the scripture says, with all of our heart, soul, mind, those are the mandates that you've given to the believer, and we want to be faithful to that. So check our hearts today in our devotion to you as we bring this message in Jesus' name, amen. I'm jealous. Bad thing, good thing. I believe there are times that we can honestly say that jealousy is bad because it leads people to act in some very strange and crazy ways that are not anywhere near the way God would want us to, to be. You know, sometimes people are so overly suspicious of one another and they don't have a right to be and they're jealous over crazy stuff. I heard a joke about Adam and Eve when they were in the garden and Eve said to Adam, you know, you, you've been running around with other women. And uh, that's what she told him. And Adam responded, how in the world does that make sense when you're the only woman on the earth? That's just being unreasonable. But Eve wouldn't let it alone. She continued to pester him about who he'd been with. And late that night when he fell asleep, he felt somebody poking him in his side, and it was Eve. So it woke him up, and he says, what are you doing? She said, I'm counting your ribs. 
That's bad jealousy right there. That's jealousy gone crazy. That's jealousy off the chain. That you're afraid of something that you ought not to be afraid of, and you act on it by words, deeds, uh, and thoughts. But God says there are times that jealousy is good. Even the God, God himself declares that he's jealous. In the Old Testament, he tells us that I am the Lord, thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Watch what he says. Thou shall have no other gods before me. Thou shall not make unto thee any, not a single one, graven image or any likeness of anything. Nothing in heaven that's on earth beneath in the water, under the earth, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. Watch this. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Now, he's not talking about jealousy with the human emotion, but it is the fact that these actions will move me and stir me. Number one, they're not any other gods. But I would be moved if you tried to make them or tried to make me in the image of one. I would be moved and I would be stirred. This type of jealousy has the other person in view. In other words, for any man or woman to make an idol or image of something in heaven, earth, in the water, under the water, you would be hurting yourself. And therefore, God's best interest is don't do that which will take you away from me and bring you harm, hurt, damage. That's what jealousy does. It keeps the person right where good jealousy keeps you in a protected position. And God says, to that end, I'm jealous. Now, when his apostle in the New Testament uses this picture and illustrates it, it is used in such a way to help us see how jealousy for the right purpose and for the right reason is a good thing. For example, he uses the illustration of a uh, man who is trying to keep his daughter chaste to be married to a husband someday. That's a good attribute of any father. That's a good thing that a father would want to stand, watch, guard, protect, insulate, not isolate, but insulate the daughter so that nothing happens that's going to affect the happy day that is coming someday. He doesn't want that to take place. So this is a good thing that a concerned earthly father would do. And Paul does tell us in 1 Corinthians 4, 14 through 21, he puts himself in the place of a spiritual father. He said, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I begot you. Paul is talking about how he had come to Corinth. There was no gospel witness. He witnessed the people were saved. He said, I have begotten you through the gospel. And then he says, wherefore, I beseech you, be your followers of me. He didn't say I controlled you. He doesn't say I owned you. He's not saying I gave you spiritual life. He is saying God used me as an instrument to bring you to faith. I think you can trust me to keep leading you. He also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 14, he says to the Corinthian church, same letter, same people, what will you, will you, shall I come to you with a rod or in love? He's speaking to them like as a father, knowing that there's a time the rod is needed. There's time love is needed. Spirit of meekness, he's trying to say to them, I have a right to bring the rebu rebuke and the reproof that is necessary in your life because I have your best interest at mind. Oh, I couldn't have done this growing up at least not on the day that it occurred. But I am thankful that I had a father and a mother that used the rod. We called them switches. 
And even then, it wasn't a single switch. They would have you go pick them, your own punishment. And if you didn't bring a suitable size for the occasion, they sent you back out. And then when you came back inside, mom and dad would take these switches, normally three, gave them a little decorative thing and platted them, peeled them, and then left a few leaves on the end. Uh, I don't know what that was all about because they didn't stay after the first swing anyway. But I'm so thankful. Hear me well. Now, I would have never told them thank you for whooping me. But when I look back at it, I know they had my best interests at heart. And I thank God for them. Thank you, Mama and Daddy. One more time. I couldn't have told you that then, but I can say it today. When people come, as Paul is trying to come to the Corinthian church, and remember, they were a church that was out of kelter, 1 Corinthians, and he was coming, reproving, and rebuking, and correcting, and challenging them. What was he after? Their best interests. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse 20 through 20, uh, 21 through 22, there is a rivalry going on. He said in these passages, and listen to it, you cannot serve God and the devil. In 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 10, he says these words, verses 21. He says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of the devil. You cannot be a partaker of the Lord's table and of the devil's table. What he's saying, church, then and what he's saying to us today, you can't walk holding on to God's hand and Satan's hand at the same time. You cannot have a good God and a good devil. You can't, as we would say, walk down both sides of the roads at the same time. There should be a choice and an allegiance to the choices that we make. Joshua said, as for me and my house. And when you make that choice, you should not be going tippy-toe backwards and forward. You, you shouldn't slip out in the darkness, is what I'm trying to tell you. And then he says in verse 22, do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? If you try it, God will be moved and stirred. And then he asked the question in the verse, are we stronger than he? Meaning, if we try to play uh, play God against Satan in one here, in with the other. He says, not only will it not be beneficial, you will not be able to be successful because God is not going to allow that happen with impunity, meaning something's going to take place. And so Paul is given the picture about a loving father who has a, a duty and the privilege uh, of presenting his daughter pure and chaste before her husband someday. Now we see the picture because in Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify, cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Ephesians says there's a presentation one day. It's not happened yet. We are, we are spouse. We're in a great relationship with the Lord. But he says there's coming a day when the Lord and his espousal is going to get together. That's called the rapture. And when we get there, he wants us chased, clean, prepared, and ready. But in between that time, God uses people like Paul and, uh, Barna and Barnabas and Peter and James and Jude and John to give the word to keep people clean until that day comes. Because God does not want us to be distracted in this world from what our true destiny is is one day going to be. Now, Paul says, that's the picture. This is what I'm jealous about. I want to get you where you need to be with the Lord, and I have a responsibility. He took on that duty as a spiritual leader. 
but he directs them to understand what he feared most for them. What he, what he was, I say the word concern, that would uh, sidetrack this, this goal of Paul to get people to the Lord, walking with the Lord, devoted to him, in love with him, single focus on him to the day that we meet him. He knew that there was an adversary to that. And so he says in 2 Corinthians 11, he says, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste version, that's the image, to Christ. But I fear, this was his concern, lest by any means as the serpent beguile Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now, Paul is very clear on his theology here of evil because he recognizes behind the existence of evil, listen to me, church, is a person. Now, he is talking about the same person in Corinth, watch me now, that was in Eden with Eve and Adam. So millenniums have gone by and the person that was in the Garden of Eden was also working in the church of Corinth. And you know where I'm going with this. Saints, he is at work today. Same one. He was at work in the garden. He was at work in Corinth. That same person has the same MO. He has the same tactics. Nothing has changed. The person of Satan is real. He's not talking about just bad fortunes. He's talking about an evil person, one who is crafty, one who is cunning, one who is deceitful, one who has, does not have your best interest or mind at heart. Peter says, your adversary, the devil, he calls him out. He's walking about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And so he says, this is a theology that you need to have is a theology of evil based on a person who is trying to get others to move away from a relationship with God. But he's particularly talking about Christians. Now, here's some ways in which this serpent work. He doesn't just come out and tell you what he is. You know, if Satan just walked up and said, I'm the devil, plain and clear, he probably wouldn't get too many customers with that. If he said, my goal is to trick you and I'm going to use everything I can and I'm going down to the pit and I want you to come with me. That's not how he introduces himself or talks about his tactics. He's a bait and switch person. And what I mean by that is that he will take lies and embed them inside of truth like you would bait a hook. You see, the fish eats worms. But when you put a hook in the worm, you have changed what that worm will do to the fish. God has truth. But the moment you embed evil in that truth or error in that truth, then it has a design of hooking you and pulling you away from where you were saved. Getting you out of the environment that God has designed for you to be. When he baits it, He's trying to make it easier for you to swallow, harder to see, and difficult to understand. All at the same time trying to tell you that it's better than what God has to offer. A few verses in Corinth where Paul is laying down this theology of evil centered around the person. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, all in Corinth, he wrote to the Corinthian saints in an early letter. He said, I've come to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of Jesus Christ. What is he discussing? Some man or woman had gone absolutely bonkers and they were living such an ungodly life. And the odd thing about it is Paul saying, they're going to be saved, but their flesh is going to be destroyed. That's, bottom line, he is saying they're ready for heaven, but they are no earthly good. 
Their usefulness on this earth has been destroyed because they are living in league with Satan and they've moved far away from God. And so their usefulness is gone. In 1 Corinthians 7, verse 5, Paul again talking about this theology of evil. He said, defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent, that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer and come together, that Satan tempt you not. Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. He's writing to husbands and wives. And I want you to hear me, husbands and wives. God is not only out to destroy a person's life if you're in union with another human being, a man and a woman, he's also out to destroy that union because the destruction of that union affects so many other things. I was listening to a guy the other day as he said he was talking about his lifestyle uh, and he mentioned to his dad that he was going to come out. But he says what affected him was when his mother and father got a divorce, it affected him at that point and he began to look for other things. Satan destroys relationships. And one of the goals is to destroy the relationship between a husband and a wife, which makes up the fabric and the foundation of society. So as the homes are destroyed, churches are being affected, and so is society. Now again, this is not about losing salvation, but this is a tactic of the enemy. And let me say to you couples that are married, Satan is out to destroy your marriage. Don't give him no room. Don't let him, don't let him come in with his subtleties in any form. Angry, be angry, sin not. He's, he, he, understand how he works. And if you're single today, Satan is out to destroy you too. You said, I'm not married, but watch this. I'm reading these last few days, uh, it's all over the news how religious uh, organizations are revisiting this thing about sex before marriage. And now they're starting to say, well, maybe it's not a sin. Listen to me. Don't you listen to that foolishness. God was very clear on what sins and lusts of the flesh are, but now you have people trying to soften it, make it more presentable, and I can assure you who's behind that because now you got entangled uh, relationships, you have children, you have broken hearts. That's not God. And so it's really better to wait until God does what with the first man, till he brings that spouse that he wants you to have instead of sampling everything that's out here. And I'm reading people saying it's OK with God today because we're in 2021. No, no, that's Satan trying to bring about destruction of an institution of marriage or what should be in life before you marriage because that serves his purpose. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 11 says, lest Satan should get an advantage. Listen to his theology of evil. He's constantly telling you, Satan, Satan should get an advantage for we're not ignorant of his devices. And what we believe that he's refer referring to here is that the Corinthian church had evil in the church. But they said, we're big enough, we're progressive enough, we can handle this. And then finally said, no, Paul said, you got to get the leaven out because a little leaven will leaven the whole lump. And so they went and dealt with the leaven, that which was evil, and made sure the person knew who was a believer you can't live here with us like this because we've now seen this is wrong. But you know, Satan is a, he's a strategist. And sometimes he'll use your, your weight or your strength in wrestling. You use the weight against the person. So now the church is saying we have dealt with evil and we're not going to deal with evil. You committed evil. So we done with you. He said, no, no. The person who's done evil and repented, you forgive them and you take them back. But he says that's another device of Satan is to swell you up with your own self-righteousness and your own importance. 
that you don't show mercy or grace to somebody else. Now, I'm glad God saved sinners. And one reason that I'm glad that he saved me is I know how far down he reached to get me. Now, here's what that'll do. That ought to cause you to have compassion on people that are out of the way. And it ought to cause you to think, maybe my job is to help this person, not push them down farther. Someone says that sometimes the church is the only place that shoots its wounded instead of helping them heal. God deliver us from that. And while someone else said to me, well, isn't the church a hospital for people to get well? I said, there's another thought. If you come to Christ to get well, you ought to stop doing what made you sick. That's the solution. But don't come and say, I, I did this to get ill and I'm going to lay here in the bed, keep doing the same thing. What's the purpose of seeking therapy or help? It won't help you. So you got to know the devices of Satan, how he's out to trick. In 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 through 14, Paul still talking about the theology of evil. He says, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. For no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, the ministers of Satan, also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to the works. Here's another tactic of Satan. He said, do you know that Satan will deceive you with counterfeit leaders? And that is, I will, you know, think about it. If I'm Satan, and if I own the streets, and own all of the, the bad places you shouldn't go, I, I want to I get some folks over here, so where am I going to go? I'm going to go to the church. And so he brings, not just to the pew, I'm sad to say this, but some of the worst examples of what a Christian has ought to be has had titles and handles in the house of God. Now, don't be shocked for you that are unbelievers and you point and say, yeah, but look at all them hypocrites in there. I want to tell you, I'm going to agree with you when it's wrong. But I'm also going to tell you that will not save you from dying and going to hell yourself because you found a hypocrite in the church. You got hypocrites everywhere on your job, supermarket. You got them in the government. <laughs> they in your family. You probably won yourself. But watch this. Knowing that there's evil in the house of God isn't going to stop you. But it is a terrible strategy. And it works that oftentimes to trip people up. Satan has counterfeited leaders and put them in the pulpit, gave them titles, gave them handles, and they lead people astray. Without going into a lot of details, you better check the qualifications of leadership in the book of Timothy and Titus and hold leaders, including me, to that standard that the word of God gives. And if they're not there fitting that standard, probably not going to be the best leader. So he says, no, that's a strategy of Satan. And, and, and that's something that Paul said, I want to protect you from because they're going to transform themselves into angels and ministers of light when, in fact, they're really instruments of the devil. And then in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7, I'm talking about a theology of evil. Paul is saying, uh, the, as Satan beguiled Eve. There was a person, he had methodologies, he had strategies, and he worked it. In 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7, Paul said this, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Paul says sometimes Satan is the one who's bringing you troubles. But don't get your theology of evil messed up. Because we also know Satan 
had to go to God one day and talk about Job. He can't do anything that God doesn't let him do. But God, why would you let Satan have access to my body? While Satan meant it for bad, God says, Paul, I'm going to do this. I'm working with you so good, giving you so much. I don't want you to get swelled up above measure. And so I'm going to allow you to have a little something to bring you low. Keep you humble. And so he said, I'm going to let him touch your body. You this morning uh, who are struggling in your body, it may be a bad thing, but if it's permitted by God, find out what God is trying to do with you in the midst of that. I've told you about a good friend of mine in, in the islands. He has a member of his church. Um, and when I go there, he sits in a, in a wheelchair on the right. He's got a normal head. He's got a uh, normal sized man here, but his body about that long, his whole body, uh, his limbs are not there, his, his no arms, no legs, but he sits there on Sunday morning. And I asked him, you know, how do you get to church? He, he wiggles to the front door on Sunday morning. They pick him up, put him on the bus. Somebody takes him off the bus, put him in the wheelchair. Members bring him in. Watch this. He hasn't used that as an excuse for not being in the house of God, which makes me wonder, what excuses do you give to not serve God when that man is not letting what is going on in his body? By the way, he ministers over the radio and he has a type of computer where he sits on the floor and he uses a pointer to type out messages. And when they put the speaker in front of him, he preaches and teaches over the radio in the island and when I first saw that, I said, Dwight Scott, shut your mouth because you don't have a problem. But I was also challenged. Here's a man buffeted, still serving God. Now, the man don't get the glory. God gets the glory for a man loving God enough to, to allow himself to be in this condition that he could serve God. But watch this. One day he won't be walking around or rolling around like that. He's going to have a brand new body. So serve the Lord in the body that you got, even with the problems that you have. And don't let Satan make you say something bad about God or miss out on what you could do for God, even though you're going through troubles in the body. Now, we talked about Paul's picture. There's a, husband, there's a man trying to take care of his daughter. So he's jealous Rightfully so. And we see who's out here trying to pull this daughter from her position that she has in Christ. And Paul is identifying all of these people. You know, the responsibility of dead when they run into a guy. Uh-uh. They run into a man. Uh-uh. You know, he's trying to tell the girl something. This, this, you know, matter of fact, girls, before you marry some guy, take him home to your daddy and let him spend a little time with him. And then I do vice versa. Take that girl home, let her spend a little time with your mama. Because if it's something off, I'm not saying 100% of the time, but I'm going to tell you many times, those who have been in relationships with the Lord longer and with themselves, they can tell you and see things you can't see and you need to listen. And so uh, Satan works to beguile, trick, and that's a tactic to pull people away. That's what God is after. Stay safe. But he's also telling them, here are some things that don't substitute. So why we are attached to the Lord, church member, why you are in, 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 in a relationship with the Lord, be sure that you don't try to replace these next topics that Paul is going to talk about in his verse. Chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse 4. He said, for if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom you've not preached. He says, now, don't don't listen to people talking about a different Jesus. I won't be able to go through all of this, but let me give you a few things. He's talking about the person who preexisted. That's the Jesus, not somebody who started at a point in time. He preexisted. Not only did he preexist, but we're talking about the Jesus that was Co-equal. He was with God and was God. Don't let anybody mess with that Jesus. And then this Jesus was virgin born. 
He did come into the world as a man, humanity, born of a virgin, walked this earth. Don't let nobody mess with that Jesus. He was also a miracle worker. Yes, he did walk on water. Yes, he did cast out demons and sight and the lame. And yes, he did feed the multitude. Every bit of that he did that no other man had done before. He was also the Jesus who was sinless. Never sin in thought, word, actions, or deed. And because he was sinless, it made him a perfect sacrifice, a substitute for our sins. In order to be that sacrifice, he allowed himself to be crucified. He was buried, but thank God he rose up. But in his rising, I'm talking about this Jesus. He arose and showed himself. But then my Bible says after being on the earth so many days, he ascended up. And right now that Jesus has ascended and is exalted. And my Bible says he's sitting at the right hand of the father. But then that Jesus is also coming again. Whew. That's the one we're looking for with the prince in his hands and in his side and in his feet. That's the one. Don't you let nobody mess with that Jesus. This is the Lord. Why call ye me Lord? If Jesus can't be Lord of your life, you've messed up. In other words, I will do what I want to do. I'll just take Jesus to go to heaven. He's Lord of life now. He loves you and me, and he wants the best for us. This is the Jesus who has the right to rule. He doesn't just control my salvation, why call me Lord, Lord, and then don't do what I say. He, he has the right to rule. We want to keep in focus. That's the Jesus that we're talking about. He says, don't, don't get hung up with another. And then Paul says, don't get hung up with another spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a force or energy. He's a person. He also in the Godhead is co-equal. With God. He is the one who has taken up residence in the body of a believer, which is why, saints, we need to take care of this temple. Because the Bible says in Corinthians, you're t Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? And he said, You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. You can't just do what you want to do, it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost is the one who convicts us of sin when we fail. Listen to him, saints. You don't have to always get it from a preacher. But when you are failing and sinning, it is the ministry of the Holy Spirit to grab your attention to how you're moving away from a right relationship, fellowship, I should say, with the Lord. If we said that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth, and it is the Holy Spirit who convicts us. It's the Holy Spirit who gives us gifts. And please study the topic of gifts because there is so much mess out here about the Holy Spirit and gifts. He doesn't give everybody the same gifts. He didn't do it then. It's not a requirement that everybody speak in tongue. It, it's not there. When you read, he gave one this and another that. And not only that, even when he gave the gifts, such as tongues, he gave restrictions that there was only supposed to be two or three in a meeting. That's the Holy Spirit telling you how he will operate his gifts. And then if there's no interpreter, keep your mouth. Listen to the Holy Spirit because there's much confusion. It may be good intentions, but it is a breadcrumb of falsehoods about the Holy Spirit that leads people away into areas that they should not go. There's another thing about the Holy Spirit. You shouldn't try to lie to him or lie on him. You know, <clears throat> the one thing that he does is he's a discerner. When Ananias and Sapphira tried to fool the church concerning those gifts, Paul challenged them and, and Peter challenged them and said, hey, you lied to God. But later on, he says, you lied to the Holy Spirit. So there should be no attempt to fool. By the way, what you are in your private life is what you are before God. And it does not matter if you suit it up 
and perfumed up and dressed up on Sunday, the Holy Spirit is watching your life. And I'm just saying, don't live a lie because the Holy Spirit has a ministry. And his ministry is he goes everywhere because he's spirit. And so there's a responsibility towards the Lord Jesus Christ. There is an allegiance that we're to have to the Holy Spirit. And then also there's an allegiance to the gospel. The gospel message should not be tampered with. First of all, by trying to add something or take something away. There are people who said, well, you got to keep this day, this law, don't eat this meat. Uh, don't wear this particular type of clothing. Uh, and you're adding to the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and the person who believes the gospel will be saved. It does not say that you're saved by grace plus anything, but by grace through faith. But there are people who tamper with the gospel. Yeah, <laughs> listening to a man on the radio driving through Arkansas. You know Arkansas's theology is sometime backwards. But he says, 21 things you must do before you can be saved. I said, oh, my soul. You might die before you get to number 15. But he said, 21 things you must do. When the Philippian jailer asked the Apostle Paul in the prison, what must I do to be saved? He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll get saved. And if your family does, they'll get saved too. I'm glad he didn't walk through 21 things you had to do to be saved. He made it clear. He made it plain. And so we need to stay devoted. Watch this. The gospel is for everyone. I have a greater appreciation for the love of God because when God made man, God's intention was to save all mankind. Not a brown, white, or black man, every man. It's not intended for one person. You said, but didn't God go to the, isn't he born among the Jews? Yes, he was. But the purpose of being born in the world is not that the Jews only. That's why he told his church leaders, go into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel to every creature. You know what else he says? He said in the book of Acts, Peter said, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation. He that feareth him is accepted. And when I peep over into the future in Revelation, I'm reading that passage where every kindred, tongue, tribe, everybody is going to be able to worship the Lord. But it is through the gospel. And so the gospel is a good news that should be given to all people. And it is not exclusive to just one. Don't add anything. Someone told me once that I wasn't saved. I was a young Christian. And I was saying grace over my food in, the, in Norfolk, Virginia, in the chow hall. Brother slipped up to me. He was kind. And see what you're doing. You're trying to walk with God. I said, I sure am. Just got saved. I'm trying to keep it going right. He said, well, you're saved. I said, I think I am. He said, well, let me ask you. Have you been baptized in water? I said, yeah. He said, well, did the water turn red when you were baptized? I said, no. He said, well, then you're not saved. You know what? I'm going to say this now, and forgive me. You run foolish people like that away from you. That was nothing but a foolish person trying to represent something that God never gave to him, and he didn't give it to us. The water has to turn red. You said, well, are there people out there crazy like that? Yes. And you know what? That, too, is a work of the enemy. He has affected them. But I was a young Christian, and I thought maybe I had missed out on something because I hadn't done those things. Now, the Lord says, through Paul, I'm jealous. I'm jealous. When I was um, getting married, Geneva and I had set our dates and, uh, for October 1974, the 19th. And uh, there was a phone call to my mother's home from a girl that I, we went to church with, trust me, keep your mind out the gutter, wasn't nothing going on there. We, we were right. I had an interest in her. She was a nice little girl when I was a young teenage, little puppy love. But that girl wouldn't have spit on me if I'd have been on fire. She paid me no attention whatsoever. So we moved on our world. Nothing ever happened. I lost contact, didn't hear from her, never heard from her. 
didn't know where she was. So the week that we're getting married, my mother's phone rang. And it was that young lady. And she called and said, Mrs. Scott, I'm calling to see where Dwight is. And my mama didn't cut no corner. She said, baby, he getting married on Saturday and he got a, a new wife he already spoken for. You know, mama saved my bacon. In other words, she says, you don't have any room here. That's where Paul is with his people. Don't let anything come in and mess up or interfere with where you ought to be with God right now because there are things trying to pull you away. Let me say this in closing. I have no jealousies of other people's ministries. And you shouldn't. For the number one, God gives every man or every person that ministry he wants them to have, and it's all the Lord. There are better preachers than me, I'm sure, better theologians. I listened to a man preach uh, yesterday on Friday, or preach Friday, and as I listened to him preach, he got into that, uh, you know, how we do down south, uh, and I said, boy, I wish I could do some of that. And I said, I, I, I missed all of that. What, what's wrong with me? And I just had to be content. This is the way God made me. And so I have to be content if he made me this way. I have to give account for him. But I, but I was listening to it, and man, he worked that crowd with, the, you know, that, that, that sermonic, we call it A-flat. And I said, Lord, can I get a little bit of that in the church? Uh, and I wanted some of it. But I had to be true to myself. God said, I didn't make you that way. I don't judge it, and I don't have no jealousies of it, of another man's oratorical skills or another man's ministry. Why? Because none of us have anything that God did not give us. But I tell you what I am jealous of. When I hear false teaching and false stuff coming over the radio and over the TV, I am jealous because I don't want to see Bannis Road Baptist Church members or any Christian fall into that trap. Some of the stuff that gets me is uh, this idea that you're going to get blessed every time you turn around, that you got, your money is on the way. Now, don't get me wrong. I need money. I'd like a promotion like anybody else. But you know what? That is not what life is all composed of. That's not the basis of it. And there's another ministry that teaches, whether you're a white supremacist or a black Israelite, that your salvation is tied up in your skin. That's foolishness on both sides. That our salvation is based on skin color. When I, I heard the Lord say, whosoever will. Let him come. And so I'm bothered when people mess with the simplicity that is in Christ. And that word simple means single-minded devotion without turning from the left or from the right. You can't be walking down the aisles to marry one man, making Google eyes to men and women as you walk. Your mind needs to be made up. And when you get down the aisle, don't stutter. <laughs> if the man asks you, do you? You, you ought to say, yes. I had one gentleman, Little Rock. He was engaged to a young lady. They were going to get married. So we're in the back. <laughs> and while we're back there, he is back there shaking like a leaf. I mean, he was just trembling. Knees were knocking. Hands were shaking. Brother was sweating. And I looked at him. And as I looked at him, I said, um, you look like you're struggling. He, 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 he's, uh, he couldn't get it out. I said, tell you what. I said, now, here's my keys to my car. It's parked right out of, on this side. Go out this side door, and you get in that car, and I'll delay everybody, and I'll explain. I said, but just going to leave. Oh, pastor, I love that girl. You know what I told him? I said, act like you love it. But I'm trying to say, church, if you're in love with Jesus, act like you love it. I want to invite you this morning, if you don't know the Lord as your Savior, invite him in your heart. Get the right Jesus by the right gospel and receive the right spirit. Father, we thank you this day for your words, this word that is in your book that is designed to keep us from being tempted to deviate, distract, and be pulled aside to something we shouldn't be pulled aside. This requires study. This requires 
devotion to truth. This, com this requires commitment to rightly discern the word of God. It does require following leaders, but it only requires that if the leaders are following Christ. So you lead and guide, Lord, in today's message. And we ask, oh Lord, if there's someone who needs to make a decision today to be, be, be aligned and connected to Christ, that they'll call on you right now and ask for your forgiveness because of your shed blood, your sacrifice, your death, your burial, your resurrection. And right now, your rule and reign is Lord, that if they'll call on you, you, you promise that person would be saved. Thank you for this opportunity to be with the saints in Jesus' name. Amen.